Dr. Kelly to labor room six. So just a confirmation he's on the way, please. Yeah, he's coming right down the hall. And hall. nurses. Can you send me nurses? I'll send two more nurses right away. What so can I help with? Is the pit still on? What's going on? Oh, we have a so We're going to turn on. What's going on? Oh, we have a so I'm going to check you now. I'm calling a code C. Let's move now. Come on, let's move. Okay. Yeah, we're clear, we're clear. Okay. Ready for it? All right, we're going to take good care of you. Don't worry about it, okay? Okay. Dr. Preston's going to come. Oh, look, we're clear. Okay, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay, now we right. need Here's the machine. You're going to feel a little right. bit of pressure on your throat as you go off to sleep. Get me, Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly, okay. Dr. Kelly, Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly. Dr. Kelly. Okay. Okay, the tube is in. Cut. Starting incision. Under optimal conditions, rapid delivery of a fetus in a safe and timely fashion should be a routine accomplishment for any obstetrical service. The need for obstetrical units to maintain a ready state is highlighted by findings that show that labor and delivery, the emergency department, the intensive care unit, and the operating room account for 50% of all adverse events and a disproportionate number of patients who sustain serious injury. Of these four specialty areas, labor and delivery is particularly unique because on any given day, we are the emergency room, the intensive care unit, the operating room, and the place where women come to labor and deliver safely. Each year, one to three percent of term laboring patients undergo emergency cesarean delivery. Most of these obstetrical emergencies are set off by or include complications of the fetal heart rate tracing, and fetal bradycardia is a common event associated with sounding the alarm. When the alarm is sounded, decision making, usually accomplished in minutes or hours, must now be made in seconds. The bedside provider must quickly evaluate the tracing and determine if immediate delivery is indicated. If the situation is deemed emergent, they then must immediately notify a physician capable of performing a cesarean section and accurately communicate their findings. Erica, I need a doctor in labor room six, please. Now, please. The physician must evaluate the tracing and determine whether or not delivery is required if delivery is warranted, the route, method, and type of anesthesia must be quickly determined and appropriate personnel mobilized. Delivery must then be accomplished in a timely manner. Any unwarranted delay in observing the emergent pattern, notifying the physician, ensuring a bedside evaluation, initiating preparations for immediate delivery, or accomplishing delivery can have important consequences on the ultimate outcome. Let's look at an actual case that illustrates the importance of these points. The patient is a gravid one para zero at 41 and a half weeks in early labor. Since admission, the patient's fetal heart rate tracing has been uncomplicated with moderate variability. But at 2108, a bradycardia begins, and immediately the fetal heart rate drops to a nadir of 60 beats per minute. The patient is turned on her side, and additional conservative measures are employed. Two minutes later, the fetal heart rate rises to a rate of 100 beats per minute with a brief period of marked variability presumed to be the result of this acute hypoxic event. Within 90 seconds, however, the fetal heart rate once again drops to 60 beats per minute. Conservative measures are continued. Seven minutes after the bradycardia begins, the patient is taken to the OR. The patient arrives in the OR at 2118, 10 minutes after the onset of the fetal bradycardia. The OR crew is immediately present. The fetal heart rate is now 70 beats per minute, with occasional increases to 90 beats per minute, lasting for 10 to 15 seconds. At 2121, two and a half minutes after arriving in the OR, the fetal heart rate rises to 150 beats per minute. Everyone begins to relax, but before they can make it to the door, the fetal heart rate precipitously drops to 70 beats per minute once again. Transient elevations of the fetal heart rate during a bradycardic event are not uncommon and are attributed to activity by the fetal adrenal glands, one of the three organs preferentially spared during asphyxia. It appears under situations of extreme oxygen deprivation that the fetal adrenals will release catecholamines into systemic circulation, 
which can result in an increase in fetal heart rate. These brief periods of increased fetal heart rate that occur in the context of fetal bradycardia should be viewed cautiously. If the underlying condition that precipitated the bradycardia in the first place has not been ameliorated, the increase in fetal heart rate will be short-lived, as in this case. At 21-24, the patient is intubated and immediately put to sleep. 16 minutes after the bradycardia begins, the skin incision is made. At 21-30, delivery is accomplished, 22 minutes after the onset of the fetal bradycardia. A 44-10 gram male with APGARS of one and six is delivered by STAT C-section with a cord umbilical artery gas of 6.92, 64, 24, and minus 22, and a cord umbilical venous gas of 7.22, 54, 56, and minus seven. The normal cord umbilical venous gas signifying adequacy of maternal and placental oxygenation and the significantly acidotic cord umbilical artery gas evidence of an inadequacy of fetal oxygenation are highly suggestive of an umbilical cord prolapse. Of particular interest in this case is the cord umbilical artery base deficit of minus 22. The base deficit, a derived number that measures the degree of lactic acid in systemic circulation, was equal to, in this case, the total time of the bradycardia, 22 minutes. Studies have shown that in cases of extreme reductions in oxygen delivery to the fetus, as is presumed to occur in most fetal bradycardia with a fetal heart rate of less than or equal to 60 beats per minute, the base deficit can increase rapidly and a significant acidosis may result. Providers should therefore treat transient elevations of the fetal heart rate during bradycardic events with extreme skepticism and continue preparations for emergent delivery should the elevation in fetal heart rate be brief. At the core of a timely and effective response to fetal bradycardia is the assessment of three key clinical variables, simply remembered by the mnemonic, rate, route, room. In rapid sequence, the tracing is evaluated to determine if an emergent response is truly warranted or if continued close observation is appropriate. A true crash cesarean section is generally reserved for a sustained fetal bradycardia of 60 beats or less remote from delivery. When the fetal heart rate is reduced to this magnitude, cardiac output cannot be sufficiently maintained, umbilical blood flow decreases, and a sustained bradycardia of this death can precede fetal death. If the inciting event is iatrogenic, for example, maternal hypotension from epidural administration, or uterine tetany or hyperstimulation from excessive Pitocin administration, treating the presumed cause of the inciting event will usually result in a rapid resolution. 